God bless you. You may be seated at this time. I'm so very thankful that you have joined us this morning. I thank God for allowing us to weather the storms that have been going on in this world. If there was ever a time for you to be praying, the time is now. Now is not the time to be silent. We must be on our knees and we must be praying for this country. And not only the country, but the world. God has demanded and commanded that we be fruitful and multiply. Say this with me. I must be fruitful and multiply. Ladies, don't worry. I'm not talking about babies. I'm talking about being disciple makers. I'm talking about eliminating darkness in this world by recreating light, by telling people about the truth of Jesus Christ who is able to deliver. So today is Pentecost. Can you say Pentecost? Pentecost or Passover uh, and the first fruits. This is by R.C. Sproul. I just want to read this to you to give you some background on Pentecost uh, as it was in Israel in the Old Testament. Passover was not the only spring festival celebrated under the covenant, for the Israelites also commemorated the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. The Feast of First Fruits actually took place during the week long Passover celebration. On the first day after the Sabbath, that occurred in the midst of the week. Pentecost occurred 50 days after that Sabbath. How many days? And mark the culmination of what started as the Feast of First Fruits. As its name indicates, the Feast of First Fruits marked thanksgiving to God for the first fruits of the harvest. Can we give thanks to God for everything he's done for us already this year? He's already been good to us. He spared our lives. He's allowed us to travel here and there safely. He's blessed us already, so we bless you for that, God. In this case, the grain and cereal harvested in the spring in ancient Palestine. At this festival, the Israelites offered the very first sheaf of the harvest and were not allowed to eat anything from the crop until they gave its initial portion to the Lord. This required a great deal of faith. Church, can you say faith? This required a great deal of faith on the part of the Israelites as they will be giving the offering of first fruits at a time when not much was ready to be harvested. They had to trust God that he would indeed provide the fullness of grain that had yet to come forth, something that from a human perspective was far from certain given that the people's utter dependence on the right amount of rainfall and so forth to give the best crop. So they were dependent upon the rain just as we are dependent upon the rain. And I'm not talking about rain that falls from the sky as it relates to water. I am talking about the Holy Spirit falling upon us that we might be fruitful and multiply. Several nights ago, I woke up and the Lord spoke to me and he said four types of fields. And I was half asleep, so I didn't know if he was talking about some family named fields or what. But he said there's four types of fields. Then he sent me in his word in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Luke 8, 4 through 15, or the words will also be on the screen. Four types of fields. How many types of fields are there? Four. And only one of these fields is good. So that means we've only got a 25% chance of being one of these good fields. That means that just a remnant of us are going to produce the fruit that God desires to see in our lives. Are you bold enough to say, I am a remnant field? You've got to believe that God is going to use your life for his glory. And that's the reason that you're here on this earth. Because the last thing you want to hear when you stand before God is, I never knew you. So we desire to be faithful servants of God in a field that produces much fruit. We're in Luke 8 and 4. One day, Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. As he scattered it across the field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. 
it began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When he said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I use parables to teach others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. This is the meaning of the parable. Say this with me, Lord, give me understanding of your word so I can be fertile soil. Verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots they believe for a while, then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. So what we have to understand here, church, is this, that we are all landowners. We are all landlords. And what we are lord over is these bodies and this life. And we are made of the dust of the earth. So you are a landlord. Say, I'm a landlord. You are Lord over this land, over the body that God has given you, and his desire is that you would be fertile soil and produce much fruit. So there was four types of fields. So in this room, there are four types of people or four types of fields. The first one was the footpath. That's those of us who we have the word on our hearts, but not in them. We know Bible scriptures and we love God and we sing songs, but the word never really makes it inside of our heart and nothing happens. There's no fruit that grows. The second type of person has a heart of rocky soil. They are faithful hearers, but not faithful doers. Their roots are short and anytime temptation or sin comes along, they fall down. So everybody's hearing the message. If you can hear me, raise your hand. So that proves that there's four types of fields in here. And the Bible says that each one of them heard the word, but they had a different response to what they heard. The, the third kind was thorny. These are hearers, but their lives are too crowded. They are busy Marthas, never growing into maturity. So all these people would hear the word of God, but they all had a different response to what they would do. And the last one is good soil. Say this with me. I am good soil. So here's what the word of God says about good soil. We hear God's word, then we hide it in our hearts and we watch over it until it produces a big harvest. John 15 and 8 says this. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples this brings great glory to my Father. So listen, our lives must produce fruit for God so that it pleases him. And Jesus said, this is the only way we will know if we are his true disciples is if our lives are fruitful. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. It says, this is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. I'll say it again. In the beginning, when God made the heaven and the earth, neither wild plants 
nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth. What had not yet come? Rain. What had not yet come? Rain. So nothing had been growing on the earth because he had not sent rain to water it. And there were no people to cultivate the soil. There were no who? People. So there was no rain and there was no people. So God could not allow the earth to produce its harvest because there was a lack of rain and a lack of people. Then, I'm sorry, verse 6. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Say, that's me. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. So, the earth had not released its harvest for two reasons in the beginning. Number one, the springs were not sufficient to release the plants and the grains. They needed the rain. So, say this with me. Lord, send your rain. The problem with a lot of us, the reason that we're not fruitful is because we've only been watered by the springs. We're satisfied with just the springs. We're satisfied with just a little bit of God, a little bit of church, a little bit of Bible, a little bit of worship. And we can't be fruitful with just the springs. We need to ask that God would send his rain in our lives that we might be fruitful and multiply. The second reason that the earth had not produced a harvest was that there was no people to cultivate the land. So God made the earth but yet there was no grain and there was no um, plants that were growing because there were no people to cultivate the land. Does that sound familiar? Listen to Matthew 9, 37 and 38. He said to the disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who was in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. We know that the harvest is great as we look through this great country of America and we see the masses marching through the streets and burning buildings down and demanding justice. But listen, there is a greater justice that comes from God. And he demands that anybody that's going to go to heaven must be justified through Jesus Christ. So the cry that should be in the streets is, Lord, save me. There is a greater justice that God wants to do in this earth. So we are all fields. Say, I am a field. We are all fields. And just as things grow in the dirt, they grow in us. What we grow depends on what we sow. Things grow in us. Listen to me. Things grow in you. If you are an angry person, then anger is going to grow in you because you're made of the dust of this world. And just like if you plant tomatoes in a garden, tomatoes are going to grow in the dirt. Well, we're made of dirt and we can be fruitful. We can either have good fruit or we can have evil fruit. And what really matters is who we are allowing to sow into our lives. So the greatest determiner of what we will grow is who is the primary sower in your life. What farmer are you around the most? Are you around farmer Jesus the most or are you around his enemy, the devil the most? Are you in the word more or are you in the world more? Whatever farmer you hang around with the most, you're going to catch his seed. And I'm telling you, baby, your, your dirt is very fertile. Just look at the weeds in gardens. None of you have ever planted weeds in a garden, but here they come. Why? Because the dirt is very fertile and it will grow whatever gets in it. And I'm trying to tell you that you will grow whatever gets into your spirit. Whether it be good or whether it be bad, you are very fertile. So you must be careful who you're hanging around with and not allow the enemy to sow evil into your heart or into into your life. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit needs to come and be round up for some of us 
and just begin to spray all the weeds and spray all the things that are growing in our lives that don't belong there. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that every evil thing growing in our lives would be killed and replaced with good fruit that will make you happy in Jesus' name. Somebody praise God in here. Remember what I said. The greatest determiner of what we will grow is who is the primary farmer or sower in our lives. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, can you say, as the workers slept, that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. That's exactly what the devil does. We could do our best to plant good things in our lives, but the word of God says that under the cover of darkness, the enemy comes in at night and throws in evil seeds among the good that has already been planted. And it says in verse 28, when the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? Say, where did they come from? Some of you don't even know where your anger came from, where your depression came from, where all those things that are not like God came from. They came from the enemy because it's his desire to pervert everything that is good. All of us have a desire to be righteous and holy, but every once in a while, temptation and sin creeps its way into our garden. Well, how did it get there? While we were sleeping, while we weren't praying, while we weren't in the word, while we weren't submitted to the Holy Spirit, the devil comes in and plants evil seed among the good, but they have to grow together. Let's continue. An enemy has done this, the farmer explained. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked? No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Listen, church, there's going to be a harvest. Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them. And to put the wheat in the barn. Listen, you want to be in the barn. You want to be the wheat. So we have to be aggressive when it comes to weeds that are growing in our lives. We have to say, Lord, change my bad attitude. Lord, change my bad habits. Lord, allow me to have a hunger for your word like never before. Lord, may I praise you instead of complain as much as I do. Get the weeds out because the last thing we want to do when he sends the angels to harvest the saints and the sinners, is to be among the sinners. We don't want to burn. Matthew 13, let's go there to Matthew 13 and verse 36. Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, the son of man is the farmer. Who's the farmer? Jesus Christ himself is the good farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out 
and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous say, I am the righteous. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Lord, help us to understand. We play games, but God does not. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. It says this. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. This is, oh my goodness, say this again, say this with me. I will always harvest what I plant. Verse 8 says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Listen, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Because the things that you watch and the things that you hear are planting seeds into your life, and you are very fertile, and those things will grow. If you watch movies that are full of curse words, all the time. Eventually, you will find yourself cursing. Why? Because you always sow, you always reap what you sow. So if you put bad in, you'll get bad out. If you put good in, you'll get good out. And that is the reason we must read the Word of God. That is the reason that we must pray so that our lives will be fruitful and God will be blessed. So in the beginning, God told Adam to be fruitful and multiply. And then later on, Jesus told the disciples that they could not be fruitful unless they abide in him. So listen, what we have to do with our lives to make them a good field, because our lives could never be a good field by themselves. What makes our lives to be a good field is when we put our lives in Jesus. He is the good field. And listen to what he told his disciples. John 15, 4 through 6 says this. Remain in me and I will remain in you. So listen, church, you are a field. Your body is made of the dust of this world. You are a field. And in order for your life to produce good fruit that is worthy of God, you must plant your field in Christ. And here is what he is saying remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me say this I cannot be fruitful unless I remain in him so our problem is this we have these weekend visitations with God and wonder why our lives aren't fruitful. It's because we're not remaining in him. We must remain in him. And he says, I will remain in you. He says, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. So do you want to be fruitful or do you want to be burned? Do you want to be fruitful or do you want to be burned? If you want to be fruitful, you remain in him. 
So you just don't come to church on Sunday, but live however you want to live all week long. That's not remaining. And the word of God says that if we don't remain in him, we will wither away, dry up, be collected as a branch and thrown into the fire. Oh, well, that's kind of harsh. No, it's not. You've been given a chance. You've been given the opportunity. You've been told the truth. He said, remain in me. God does not want weak in visitation. He wants you to remain in him at all times. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to increase our fruitfulness and productivity. Can somebody say Pentecost? So what are we supposed to be making? What are we supposed to be producing? Well, a seed produces after its own kind, and God is called us to be disciple makers. Now, that's where we failed big time before church ended abruptly months ago. We were good at coming to church, but as far as being disciple makers, every single one of us needs improvement. Raise your hand if you need improvement as it relates to being a disciple maker. Well, guess what? Disciple making is your fruitfulness. That proves that you are fruitful and multiplying when you're causing other people to fall in love with Jesus Christ and follow after him. Otherwise, we're disconnected from him and we're withering up and we're dying and drying out and we're going to be thrown into the fire. I've got news for us. There are going to be plenty of people in hell that went to church all the time. Going to church doesn't save you. Abiding in Christ is what saves you. We must abide in him and he will abide in us. And it's not religion. It's not a practice of a certain amount of things. It's a love relationship. It's all about love. I think he agrees. Yes, he might be looking at an angel on the balcony. All right, let's keep going. So, the Holy Spirit empowers us to become witnesses, fishers of men, witnessing the nature and character of God within us. So, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming to earth, was not just about people talking in tongues. The Holy Spirit is not just about making you dance. The Holy Spirit is not just about making you feel good. The Holy Spirit is a worker, and he's come to help us to be fruitful and to multiply. Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23 say this, But the Holy, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these. What does that mean? There's no law against them. You can have as much of that as you want. Do you understand that? The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Why do we need this fruit? Because it's hard to be a disciple maker. It's hard to win people to Jesus if you got an ugly attitude. It's hard to win people to Jesus if you're angry. It's hard to win people to Jesus if you're impatient. It's hard to win people to Jesus if you're mean. It's hard to win people to Jesus if you're not gentle or you're out of control. So the Holy Spirit comes upon us, not just so that we can pray in another language, not just so that we can dance in the Spirit, so that we can be fruitful as we go out into the harvest and we might produce much fruit for God because we carry the nature of God. He enables us to carry the nature of God, and that's what the people witness. When you are born again and you have the Holy Spirit in you, the people around you should be witnessing the very nature of God as the fruit comes into your life. The second thing that the Holy Spirit enables us to do as a witness is that signs and miracles will follow us. Mark 16, 17 through 18 say this, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Can anyone say, I believe? So the word says, miraculous signs will accompany or follow those who believe. 
They will cast out demons in my name. So listen, you don't have to be afraid of demons or devils or evil people because you've got the power of Jesus Christ abiding in you, and he's given you authority over every demon in the world. And there is a demon of sickness that's been released in this world. This virus is evil, but listen, you don't have to fear the virus. You don't have to fear evil because you've been given power over all the things in this earth and they are under your feet these signs will follow that's what the bible says that it will happen it's a guarantee because the word of god says his word never returns void to him these signs will follow them that believe they will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages, and they will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. How many of you have ever prayed for somebody and they were healed? Every single one of you that's a believer, you have that power living on the inside of you. The last thing that the Holy Spirit allows us to do as witnesses is to set, show the saving power of our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 24, verse 44 through 48 say this. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophet and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Let's pray this. This is powerful. Say, Lord... Open my mind to understand the scriptures. Verse 48, 6. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. And Jesus said, you are witnesses of all these things. So listen, we are not allowed to sit on this information. Because if we sit on this information and we don't tell people about Jesus, that means we're disconnected from him. And the only way to be fruitful and multiply, if I'm a disciple, then my fruitfulness is when I can cause another person to follow Jesus Christ because I am a disciple maker. So the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to be witnesses for God and have a boldness when it comes to telling people about Jesus. Can everyone just lift your hands in this place for one moment? Holy Spirit, it's usually been commonplace that we've been afraid to tell people about you outside of these doors, but no more. I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that a boldness would come over us by the power of the Holy Spirit that we would be witnesses in all the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord and has the power to forgive sins. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So as we finish up, at first... Our natural work as Adam, the first Adam, we were to be cultivators. He was going to put us in the garden, and we were to keep the garden. But now there's a second Adam, and his name is Jesus Christ. And the work that he's called us to is a spiritual work, and he's calling us to be reconcilers. So when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Listen to the, miss, the mission that you have now should you choose to accept it. The Holy Spirit wants you to not be a cultivator of the land, but he wants you to be a reconciler of the land. Who is the land? The land is the lost. We live in the land of the lost, and there's many people out there that don't know about Jesus Christ at all. And your mission... Is to be fruitful and multiply. Your mission is to be powered by the Holy Spirit to be a reconciler. Let's hear what a reconciler is. 2 Corinthians 5 and 18. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. 
And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. So listen, he's given all of us a task. So when we stand before him, that's what we're going to be judged by is the task. Did you complete the task that I have given you? For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So listen, we got a choice to make, church. As the church has opened up again and we've reconvened, we've got a choice to make. Are we just going to be people that come to church and risk being cut off from God and being dry and not fruitful and burning? Or are we going to do what God told us to do? We can't think that coming to church is just it, because it's not. He's given us a task, a responsibility. He died for people that go to hell every day that don't know about Jesus. While we come to church and are silent and God is not pleased. So the Holy Spirit has given us the power to be witnesses in this earth and to call, cry out to the lost to come back to God. You see, God gave Peter and the disciples, a great catch. You remember when he saw the two empty boats and they pushed out into the water and he began to preach and then he told them this. He said, launch out into the deep and let your nets down. But what did they say? They said, we have been fishing all night. Church, that's the error we just came from. We had been fishing all night and catching nothing. But God is saying now that we are going to drop our nets for a great catch because the world is ready to hear about Jesus and receive him. They don't understand all the things that are going on. Listen, the only cure for racism is Jesus. The only cure for hatred is Jesus. I know the world doesn't want to hear that, and pol politicians don't want to hear that, but Jesus is the only cure to stop somebody from burning down a building to becoming a burning building. Amen? So they let down their nets for a great catch. And then the second great catch was an axe. Remember the Holy Spirit fell, and then Paul went out and began to, I'm sorry, Peter went out and began to preach and, and Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says this. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. So Jesus, listen, after Peter caught those fish, he was amazed. And Jesus said, don't be amazed at this. He said, I'm going to make you to become fishers of men. And we see here in Acts that it actually happened that there was a great catch that day of 3,000 souls and the church was added to. Let's stand to our feet at this time. So the command, the command is that we be fruitful and multiply. I'd like to invite the praise team back up at this time. The command is that we be fruitful and that we multiply so that we can avoid the flames. There is work to do. For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How many of you have heard that scripture before? John 3, 16. So do you know what? You're accountable. It means you know the truth. It means that when you see people dying and going to hell and living a life of sin, and you don't tell them about it, we're accountable because we know John 3.16. And not only do we know John 3.16, we know Jesus Christ, the one who came and died for us so that we can be set free from our sins. We've got to be more bold, church. I'm tired of just having people come to church. I'm no longer happy. I'm no longer satisfied when there's a world out there that's dying and we're too quiet about it.